Please, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of Saudi Arabia, it is my pleasure to now discuss before you the concept of state consent in investor-state dispute. I will not be using slides because there is too much content in them for the time I have, but if any of you is interested with the slides, I'll be happy to forward them after the presentation. As any arbitration, investment arbitration, which is an arbitration between an investor and the state on the territory of which this person has made an investment, is based on the disputing parties' consent and agreement. So we need the consent of the investor, but we need the consent of the state. States, and only states, can give such a consent in three different ways. First, under a contract that they sign with a private investor, and the parties agree that if they have disputes, they will be submitted to arbitration. It is the traditional classical way of giving consent to arbitration. Second, states can consent to investment arbitration under a domestic law for the promotion of foreign investments. Under such a law, they give guarantees to foreign investors and they give a sort of anticipated consent to investment arbitration. Uh, the first time an arbitral tribunal has found that a consent could be given in this way was in 1988 in the famous exit case SPP versus Egypt, in which my firm happened to be counsel for Egypt. Thirdly, states can also consent to investment arbitration under treaties, bilateral treaties or multilateral treaties. In these treaties, again, states grant guarantees to foreign investors, nationals of the other states, signatories of the treaty, and they give an anticipated consent or make a standing offer to arbitrate disputes they might have with these investors. Today, out of 10 investment disputes, about eight or more are based on treaties. And this is why I'm going to focus on treaties, on the consent given by the states under an investment treaty. And I have two points to make. First, I'd like to highlight the unique features of such a consent. This is compared to a consent given under a contract, because these features are to be found also when consent is given under a domestic law. But again today, the bulk of investment disputes are based on treaties. And second, I would like to address the threats that currently exist and may jeopardize uh, this consent under treaties. The unique features of state consent under a treaty are connected to the fact that when states enter into investment treaties and give anticipated consent to investment arbitration, they don't know anything about the disputes they might have in the future. They don't know who will bring the dispute, what will be the subject matter, in what circumstances the dispute will have emerged and developed. When you sign a contract with an investor, you know the party's obligations. Each party knows that if it fulfills its obligations under the contract, there should be no dispute. But under a treaty, you know nothing. So what states do, as Michael already observed a few minutes ago, is that they don't give a blank and sweeping consent to arbitrate any dispute with anyone under any circumstance under a treaty. They delimit, frame, shape their consent by identifying the beneficiaries of consent the dispute which will be eligible for arbitration. And also they like to set some prerequisites, not to jump to arbitration as soon as there is a disagreement between a state and an investor. And states and the treaties are always respondents. This is because investors are not parties to the treaties. They do not take any commitments. States do. And if an investor finds that the state has breached 
a guarantee or a right conferred to it under a treaty, then they initiate arbitrary proceedings and states are respondents. As any respondent, states like to try to destroy the claimant's case. They raise defenses, and the first defense they raise is uh, denying the jurisdiction of the tribunal because they say, I did not consent to an arbitration with this claimant or for this dispute, etc. And this gives rise to many discussions and many debates before arbitral tribunals. To illustrate how states shape their consent, you could take as an example the bilateral investment treaty signed by Saudi Arabia with Japan in 2013. Uh, it is easy accessible on the internet. Article 14.8 contains the consent of the states as a matter of principle to resolve disputes through arbitration. But immediately the states define the beneficiaries of consent. They are for a state the investors of the other state. So Article 1.3 defines the notion of investor of a contracting party. They may be natural persons, they may be companies. I will not read the provisions for the sake of time, but you may read them, they contain precise elements. And these elements also give rise to objections from the respondent states. They say, this claimant is not a proper company of uh, uh, my contracting party under the treaty because it doesn't fulfill this or this condition provided for under the treaty. Of course, the treaties define the notion of investment. They have two. So this is for the beneficiaries. They define the treaties, the disputes, which may be brought to arbitration. In the Saudi Arabia-Japan BIT, Article 14.1 states that the disputes that could be brought to arbitration are those alleged, uh, uh, emerging from a loss or damage an investor states it has suffered by reason of a breach of the treaty by the host state. Thirdly, states like to set prerequisites in the Saudi-Japan Treaty, Article 14.4, uh, learns us that the uh, investor has to send a notice of dispute to the host state to explain that it intends to bring a dispute. This triggers a period of six months during which the parties must try to find an amicable settlement. If they fail, and if the investor has not seized the local courts or administrative agencies, then the investor must send a second notice to the state at least 90 days prior to starting arbitration. This notice must contain information on the nature of the claim, the amounts claimed, etc. And then Article 14.9 uh, provides for a sort of statute of limitations. The investor must not wait more than five years as of the date when he or she was aware of the damage alleged. If this five year uh, period is lapsed, no claim will be brought to arbitration under this treaty. So this is how states uh, shape their consent. The second feature is that they don't know necessarily how to avoid a dispute. If you have a contract, again, if you fulfill your obligations, you know you should have no dispute. But because under these treaties, states promise to treat the investments under certain standards, such as the fair and equitable treatment or the full protection and security, as Michael uh, stressed, these notions are not precisely defined. So it is for each tribunal to give a definition and to decide whether this act or omission of the state is a breach of the standard. And this creates uncertainty. So much for the features. Now my second point, 
the threats on state consent under treaties. I can see two threats. The first one is not new. I would call it the arbitral threat. Arbitral tribunals may sometimes um, ignore the exact consent a state has given. They may unwittingly expand the scope of the state's consent. This can be, for example, because some treaties are badly written. I take the example of the 1992 Turkey-Turkmenistan Treaty. Article 7 says that if the disputes have not been settled through a negotiation after six months, they can be brought to arbitration, provided that, I quote, if the investor concern has brought the dispute before the courts of justice of the party that is a party to the dispute, that is the host state, and a final award has not been rendered within one year. Literally, this provision does not mean anything. You have to delete a word in it to give it a meaning. If you delete the word if, the investor has seized the local courts, it means the investor must, it's mandatory to bring the dispute first to the courts of the host state. And it's only if no award has been rendered within one year that this investor will be able to go to arbitration. This is what the tribunal in 2012 decided. Three years later, Another tribunal, in a case where I was counsel for the investor, looked at the word if. If the investor seizes the local cause, he must have no final judgment within one year to go to arbitration. But there is the word if, meaning that go, seizing the local courts is an option, not an obligation. And a third tribunal, one year later, found that it was mandatory to seize the local courts, but that it was not a jurisdictional issue, but a matter of admissibility of the claims. So, one provision, three tribunals, three different solutions. In some other cases, tribunals may be tempted to create a consent that could never exist. This is, in my opinion, the case of the Crimean cases. You know that in 2014, Russia has annexed Crimea, which was part of Ukraine. There is a treaty between Russia and Ukraine for the protection of foreign investments. As all of these treaties, the intention of the parties was to attract Russian investments in Ukraine or Ukrainian investments in Russia. But after Russia annexed to, uh, Crimea, a number of Crimean investors who had made a purely domestic investment, they were based in Kiev, they invested in Crimea, which was part of Ukraine, said we are entitled to the protection of this treaty because now Crimea is under the Russian control. Well, I submit that it is nonsensical to think that Ukraine and Russia entered into this treaty thinking if Russia invades part of Ukraine, domestic Ukrainian investments will be protected because they will be transformed into uh, Ukrainian investments in Russia. So now at this very moment, the Swiss Federal Tribunal is holding a public hearing where five judges will give their positions as to whether this treaty applies because the tribunal was seized by Russia of request for annulment. So this arbitral threat may have triggered the political threat which Michael has addressed, meaning that some states today are taking steps backwards, narrowing or even withdrawing their consent to investment arbitration. To conclude, if investments must be treated fairly and equitably, so must states. They must be treated fairly and equitably by arbitral tribunals, and they must feel that they are. If they don't feel this, they will step backwards, and this will be detrimental to investor-state arbitration.